Um, thanks for being here, bravely choosing the slot and session post lunch. Uh, my name is Sheetal Patil, and I am a researcher with the School of Environment and Sustainability at IHS. Uh, here, this panel is about the building urban resilience. Um, resilience is an issue of increasing importance to cities, planners, and policymakers. Uh, since last many decades, cities are increasingly adopting uh, resilience strategies to plan and manage range of risks, not only environmental, but social, political, economic, food security, and so on. Uh, cities are at the center of idea of resilience. Also, they are part of the problem as major source of greenhouse gas emission, but also potential victims of natural disasters uh, such as coastal cities, which are experiencing rising sea levels and the uh, uh, disasters occurring because of those. Cities are also uh, sources of future solutions via, for instance, the network of resilient cities and their capacities to manage problems uh, on human scale, uh, as well as the nature-based solutions, including green-blue infrastructure. Uh, there's a major... Um, range of disagreement around you know, the term resilience itself, with some encouraged by its all-embracing nature uh, and others decrying it as simply a catch-all concept. Uh, resilience with certain assumptions can, however, provide an array of new tools to help foster the emergence of sustainable and enduring cities of tomorrow. Uh, we have a diverse panel here uh, with presentations uh, from different cities like Delhi, Jaipur, Bangalore, uh, uh, Gurgaon, and Chennai, uh, as well as different methodologies that the panel, the presenters have uh, adopted. Uh, we'll start with, uh, we'll not go in the order which is there in the schedule because some uh, folks are still joining, the presenters are still joining. Uh, we'll start with the first presentation on the schedule by uh, Jyoti Sharma and Christopher who is uh, here in person. Uh, the title of the presentation is Felt Sustainability, How Citizen Perceptions of Sustainability Can Inform Urban Water Conservation Policy Using Case Study of Delhi. Over to you, Jyoti and Christopher. Thank you so much. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to present uh, in this seminar. Uh, I'm sorry I've not been able to join in person, but Christopher, my, my co-author, is uh, there with you. And so post the presentation for any questions, uh, especially related to the research methods, um, Christopher would uh, be there to answer all uh, queries. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, uh, I'll, I, if it's okay with you, I'll just start with uh, sharing my screen and get straight into my presentation. Uh, Please go ahead, Jyoti. Yes. Right. Um, so our presentation is really about a new concept, a new term that uh, we've coined, which is called uh, felt sustainability and uh, this talks this comes from uh, so, I've, so a bit about me which will kind of put this in perspective I've been working in the space of water conservation since 2004 so I actually started this non-profit force uh, which works for water conservation and uh, one of the things that I have noticed throughout this period is that despite all the um, all the statistics uh, that are very um, often shared by experts and flagged off as areas of concern, uh, despite all those statistics which clearly show that we are getting into a crisis situation in water, when you walk around, uh, you still see citizens not really um, understanding the seriousness of it all and still going ahead with their water usage practices as usual uh, and not making any overt uh, attempt uh, to save water. 
um, and uh, the only times when you see people really making an effort to save water is when uh, they are personally uh, facing a crisis of some sort and even then what we find is that coping strategies are um, are top of mind and any conservation practices become temporary rather than permanent and so this has always uh, baffled me because it seemed very uh, illogical uh, to me um, and so that's what got me to thinking about uh, a, a raising a question which is what uh, we i will talk about uh, going through this presentation and which is what got me to come up with this notion uh, of felt sustainability um a bit of a background uh, uh, a backdrop um, so um, if i talk specifically from the perspective of water um, i'm sure that a lot of you know that uh, india has 17% or more of the global population but only 4% of the water uh, resources and uh, and so we we clearly are uh, deficient in terms of per capita water allocation uh, globally and 54% of india is already facing high to extremely high water stress and uh, the niti aayog re uh, report has uh, very um, uh, has very strongly pointed out that 22 out of india's 32 big cities including bangalore face a water crisis uh, and uh, i'm in delhi so specifically the government report says that delhi has a shortfall of <clears throat> 24% as a non profit i can testify to the fact that it's much more than that um, and it's just the local co coping strategies that doesn't make it seem as bad as it looks the projection is that by 2000 Uh, 50 there will be a 55% difference between what the uh, country demands in terms of water and what will be available per capita uh, in terms of supply and so we are clearly headed for a, a huge crisis situation uh, and another thing that a lot of people don't realize is <clears throat> that specifically uh, that this is this is not just like a like a, a notion that water is scarce it's actually water forms the uh, is at the center of anything and everything that we do whether it is factories whether it is our homes that we build whether it is our clothes that we wear um, whether it's the food that we grow so water lies at the center of it all and so if there is a 55% gap uh, between demand for water and supply of water it clearly has implications for the india growth story for our food security so this is not just about and for our national security so it's not just about uh not having enough water to drink it's far 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 beyond that <clears throat> specifically for bangalore uh, and karnataka um i'm sure you you see that in the newspapers all all over and so karnataka doesn't just have a quantity crisis it also has a quality crisis uh, in terms of water much like most of india so i i don't want to get into those doomsday uh, statistics but broadly just uh flagging all this to say that sustainability is very clearly a concern and it's being talked about anywhere and everywhere and yet and this is what i uh, what brought me to this uh to trying to understand the minds of people is that yet people don't seem to be concerned uh, these two pictures of overflowing water tanks and cars being washed Uh, since we're talking specifically in the urban context i have placed these pictures if i was talking in the rural context i'd have an equal number of pictures in the rural context and so despite this being talked about everywhere people don't seem to be concerned and so that's the question that raises these questions why is it that people seem to be disregarding expert views on sustainability why and does this mean that there is a gap between what people actually think public perception and how experts actually define uh, water sustainability i am talking from the perspective of water but actually this would apply as much to any other environmental concern whether it's anything to do with global warming climate change you find the same mindset uh, being um, reflected that it seems to seems that there is a gap between public perception and expert definitions of what is sustainability so uh, you know we try to look for some insights in uh, published literature and so we came across a lot of uh, literature which says that water is a citizens problem in india but water conservation is not uh, there are papers which say that information 
rarely prompts substantial behavior change. Um, voluntary water conservation is still perceived as the most powerful to tool in sustainable urban water management, and yet, um, you know, it is not really being done to the extent it should be. Water pricing and uh, uh, stringent mechanisms have also been researched and have also been talked about as being uh, excellent triggers for uh, for inducing uh, change behaviors, but they're politically extremely unpopular. And so wherever they've been tried out in the world, there have been political repercussions. And so people, uh, demo democratic governments shy away from this. Um, others like, so enough and more research on this. Uh, and so there is enough and more talk about how water seems to be a problem that everybody talks about, but people do not seem to be thinking as much about conservation. And they're resistant to any imposed um, uh, um, uh, imposed uh, rules and regulations which force them to do cons conservation, but at the same time they're not really uh, uh, stepping up in terms of voluntarily uh, doing uh, uh, conservation behaviors. So we got down to our own uh, research. Uh, so we started off, we, we're not really a research organization. We're a grassroots NGO and so uh, we did research within uh, the uh, limited uh, scope that we had. So we did this research. The, the first uh, study that we did was a field study. We did that in four different kinds of uh, locations. So we looked for one urban poor location. We looked for one urban upper to middle class uh, kind of location. Uh, we looked for one uh, 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 upper class location, uh, and then we looked for one rural uh, location. So we uh, talked to uh, people. In we we designed a questionnaire, and we um, we asked. Uh, we had a we had a structured uh, uh, questionnaire, which uh, allowed us to do some qualitative, collect some uh, qualitative information uh, through interviews that we did. We did about twenty to thirty interviews at each site, and it was a semi-structured in-depth uh, questionnaire. And um, yeah, and so um, each of these areas had a different uh, water availability uh, uh, availability uh, scenario. So, like uh, uh, this one of the, the one slum that we picked up, which was an urban poor location, had government pipeline, uh, and so they were getting treated water from the government uh, through public stand posts. We took a um, a slum which did not have any pipeline at all. It was dependent on government tankers for its uh, drinking water supply. We took one middle class locality in uh, in uh, in Delhi where there was a government pipeline, but the water came for a very limited number of hours every day. And then we picked up one government locality of more or less the same socioeconomic profile, but uh, which had, um, uh, you know, it was supposed to be 24 seven, but they were getting water about 10 to 12 of the hours of the day and then we picked up a village in in uh, punjab where there was no uh, water supply uh, they, they were getting uh, water through private bore wells and a pipeline system drinking water through a pipeline system put by the government but using groundwater again so that was the those were the different types of uh, uh, of uh, study areas that we selected and we conducted our, our interviews there um this was our first research. Then we did a follow-up research. I'll share the findings together uh, in the, as through the presentation. But uh, just talking about the, we did research over a couple of years in two different ways. So uh, this was the primary uh, study, and then we did a secondary review. We thought we 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 had some findings from our first study, and then we wanted to see whether there was uh, published research which seemed to point towards similar inferences in different parts of the world. And so we did a secondary uh, study uh, where we just uh, picked out some papers uh, which had already been uh, published on Google. Uh, we use the JSTOR and the Google Sc uh, Scholar uh, databases. And we identified some key phrases uh, using which we plucked out some papers. And um, and then we, we, we picked up only uh, academic papers because we felt that they would be uh, they, they would be they would their veracity levels and their accuracy would be higher and there'd be a greater depth of information in them. So we picked out uh, those papers and then we analyzed them 
um, uh, using um, different uh, methods. So in, in the first study, we use the DDoS uh, coding of interviews. Uh, so Christopher is there and, um, you know, he is the expert on that and he'll be happy to talk about it in subsequent question answer sessions uh, about this. So we uh, coded the transcripts, we kind of ra ran the software which picked out trigger words and using those words, we tried to uh, understand the, uh, the we, we classified the uh, the uh, the observations that we got from people into different categories which gave us an indication of the way people perceived uh, uh, the uh, the problems what, what perceived water and sustainability um, so this was uh, uh, the methodology we used in the primary study in the secondary study what we did was that we developed a, uh, a quantitative code book so we uh, made a uh, so we um, so, so we um, we again used some uh, a, um, a, 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 a set of parameters to define uh, what each of the results uh, would indicate and based on that we uh, or each of the statements made in, in those papers would indicate and using that we um, we uh, kind of uh, we uh, did cross tabulations and count comparisons to find out uh, the the uh, to make make our own inferences uh, vis a vis four questions that we had set for ourselves and we uh, got those uh, got got answers to that. So this was what we uh, did in these two studies. We have also we also did uh, another study. Uh, we're also currently doing two more studies which are in progress so though we do have some indicators verifying all that we found in these first two studies i'm not talking about those right now and this is what are the key findings came out of these two studies one is that there is a substantial gap between how experts declare water supply to be sustainable or not sustainable and how citizens perceive water sustainability so basically, there's a disconnect between environmental reality and their person's own experience of water. And our, what we broadly found out was that communities and people self-assess sustainability and scarcity based on their locally situated on, and context-specific uh, circumstances. There is one comment that sort of uh, highlights, um, uh, brings out this very well. So this was a comment made by one of our interviewees and she said, what is the difference between 500 years ago and today if our daily routine is still dictated by having to wake up early to get water? Now this is very telling in the sense that 500 years ago, the waters, there was a water scarcity, but that was because the, um, the source, um, uh, the source was uh, was probably too far away and people had to go to that source uh, to get water. The source was adequate, but it was uh, far away and people could not pick up that water. And now this reality is that the source exists, uh, the source is, is depleted and there are pipeline supplies which are bringing water, but because that pipeline su uh, supply is inadequate, uh, it is the pipeline supply routine which is making them feel. So in one case, environmental sustainability was there, but uh, access in households was not there. And in today's case, environmental sustainability is not there, but access in households uh, is, uh, is, uh, is there, but limited. And so the cause is different, though the outcome is the same. And that's what- Can you hear us? Yeah. Yes, I can. Uh, you have to wrap up in just a minute, maybe. Can you go to the conclusion slide and uh, oh, wrap okay. up? Your time Take is up, actually. Okay, okay, okay. So this is what brought us to introduce the uh, our definition of field sustainability, which is that we d introduced and defined a new concept, field sustainability, and defined as the perception of resource sustainability that is derived from a person's felt experience of that resource. Um, so, we found that uh, felt, in terms of felt sustainability, people will give different answers to these questions. So, for example, what makes water sustainable? People will answer in terms of supply related uh, 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 answers, that is, whether the supply is reliable, predictable, etc. Whereas an environmentalist will say, is our source renewable? What are the threats to water sustainability? People normally flag off management and infrastructure issues and not really the source uh, issue. 
are you in a water scarcity situation again it's driven by their own supply perception rather than the source perception and what is your water source that's really telling most people do not know where the water is coming from they will talk about their proximate source which is typically a, a water supply source or a, so a, a reservoir or a pipeline or something like that other findings that are uh, studied through up was that uh, felt sustainability that the higher we we try to find out what level of felt sustainability tends to trigger conservation actions and to our surprise we found high levels of uh, water scarcity do not uh, con uh, trigger con conservation uh, actions and neither do high levels of felt sustainability it's when felt sustainability is at a medium is at a as as an average level at a uh, at the at the at not very high not too low is where uh, conservation actions seem to be the maximum we've done our further research to find out possible reasons for the, why that is but i will not be able to cover that here uh, the other thing we found out was that felt sustainability Hello? is inelastic it is driven by demand and hence out of sync with environmental sustainability which is elastic it depends on the season it is natural cycle driven but our perceptions of sustainability are inelastic because they are driven by our own need for water and low felt sustainability does not create a societal shift towards thrifty use of water and that's again surprising uh, you would fi you find that typically people tend to adopt scarcity the the psychology of scarcity makes them adopt wasteful behaviors which are driven by their own idea of when their next water would uh, a supply would be available to them and uh, yeah so um, just hurrying through this and so we have some policy insights uh, which we feel need to Jyoti, be shared with policy us? makers uh, one that Jyoti? sustainability is not seen as an environmental issue by the average person and so if Uh, voluntary water conservation is the thrust of our environmental conservation policy then the the the, the methods we are adopting as in trying to use information to Hello. scare them hi jyoti uh, yeah i'm sorry i uh, will why don't we just stop here for a second and just give the other presenters some time to speak and we'll come back to this uh, during q and a well okay i was almost there so you think you could give me like half a minute more गुरुग्राम Haryana development plan for preparedness towards pluvial uh, floods using content analysis Akanksha over to you you have 12 minutes and then uh, you keep watching on the board. Uh, so very a uh, very good afternoon to everyone hi i am audible i think speak into it yeah so a uh, very good afternoon everyone hi i am akanksha bharadwaj and i am the banja tyagi and we are from delhi technical university new delhi so the uh, research uh, uh, the research topic that we chose was the assessment of gurugram development plan for the preparedness towards pluvial flood and this was done using the content analysis uh, can we have the next slide Uh, so content of our research includes uh, of the introduction uh, the need of the study the aim objectives and the research methodology that we have followed throughout the, uh, the research the various data the various data sources uh, that we inferred uh, and uh, we took our data from the research question uh, around which the uh, entire research uh, re revolves the area of the study uh, which is gurugram Uh, the built-up density analysis basically includes uh, the uh, built-up uh, the density that has evolved over the years uh, and uh, decades apart, and how the settlement has taken place. Then the problem areas that we identified in our study area, the parameters for evolution and scoring that uh, we did, and the conclusion and further future scopes. 
So talking about uh, the problem of uh, urban flooding, uh, pluvial flooding. So the inundation of land or property within a built environment, especially in areas that are more densely packed, uh, 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 because of uh, in uh, because of the heavy rainfall that usually happens and is a res is a result of the climate change that is happening. So uh, because of that, uh, a, lo a lot of uh, areas are affected uh, by the urban uh, the water logging issue and how the uh, storm water uh, issue of rural areas is different from the urban ones is that the unplanned urbanization happens in such natural catchments uh, which includes in, uh, which increases the risk of floods uh, from uh, 1.8 times to around 8 of 8 times uh, So, so the need of the study, uh, as we know that the Gurgram, it lies on the foothills of Aravli ranges and it is around three, 30 kilometers away from the national capital. So uh, it is one of the fastest growing uh, uh, townships in India and currently it's still growing and the rapid uh, pace of urbanization that is taking place and it puts a stress on the infrastructure so it we whether we talk in terms of the capacity of the drains or the design of the drains in in fact the storm water management systems also has to be efficient again if we talk about the solid waste management so, so uh, the dumps that are there that exist uh, we end up choking the drains that exist uh, so the storm water again becomes unfunctional the other aspect that we saw was the uh, concretization that happens due to these urbanization which leads to surface seals and this probably uh, leads to a larger issue which is the surface uh, runoffs from these cities uh, leading to water runoffs and uh, then we talk about the uh, topography that has been hampered due to the uh, unplanned urbanization so this generally leads to the uh, shrinking of lakes and uh, uh, floods uh, flood plain areas and the bunds which leads to water logging issues in the city itself and creating a bigger issue uh, that has to be addressed on the city level and the other cause that we saw was the high intensity and the high, uh, frequent rainfall that happens which is a cause of a climate change so that can uh, also be not overlooked because we know that this is the time that we have to look for the uh, issue, solutions for the climate change and understanding the whole uh, 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 causes that uh, leads to the water logging issues has a certain impacts on the city so whether we talk about in the terms of the health impacts or the ecological impacts it also has psychological impacts where uh, it creates a trauma for the people who are suffering due to these problems and then we see other issues like we have waterborne diseases which even even with a small amount of water stagnating thing in the uh, urban areas it would lead to problems uh, which the uh, people face so it is directly however linked to what we face in uh, our day-to-day -day lives so coming to the aim of the study uh, so we uh, basically assessed the development plans uh, namely the 2021 uh, uh, development plan of Guru Gurugram 2025 and 2031 uh, for the uh, pluvial flood preparedness and to see if uh, it has it has talked about it has been talk, talked about in the development plans or not then uh, the objectives basically focus on uh, how to comprehend the existing literature in order to establish the evidences of flooding in the study area that are identifying various uh, water logging areas and the various problem areas in our uh, study and to assess the uh, development plans of Gurugram using the content analysis methodology based on the evolution, criteria, evolution and scoring criteria then to assess the other uh, existing literature and reports that are there apart from the development plans that actually talk about uh, the uh, urban flooding issues uh, and proposals and mitigation strategies that has not been talked about in the development plans so coming to the research methodology so we the research methodology was divided into six various stages first being the primary study where we identified why there was a need for the study and understanding the our research questions the aim objectives and the methodology that we formulated second was the uh, literature review so this was done uh, based on the existing literature on fluvial flood and the guidelines that existed in for the city 
and then further we identify the problem areas within the city so this was in terms of the water logging uh, areas which were there and were, which were highly affected by water uh, pluvial flooding uh, in gurgram and based on that the development plan 21 25 and 31 they were assessed and scored uh, scored using the content analysis further uh, we uh, tried to analyze that and we understood that uh, what the existing documents talk about urban uh, in terms of the urban flooding so for that we assessed the uh, flood control order the haryana building development plan uh, the bylaws and the uh, management uh, disaster management plans as well then uh, there were certain uh, uh, private firms that uh, specifically are working in terms of the pluvial flood so we also assess uh, the that uh, in in that terms so moving on uh, so the various data resources uh, as uh, kanjur mentioned uh, are the various development plans uh, the 2021 2025 and 2031 the flood control order uh, of the district the district disaster management plan the uh, haryana building bylaws uh, the urban flood management drainage and planning document from uh, NIDM and the Terry report uh, that uh, uh, mentions the blue green inter interventions that are there to address such challenges of urban flooding. So coming to our research question, so our intent was to understand that do the development plans address these pluvial flooding issues or not? And if they address, so to what extent are they addressing in, our, uh, in these development plans that we are talking about? And there the role of planners and the architects come into play. So, so uh, in this, we highlighted and uh, uh, highlighted the area of study. So as, uh, as uh, uh, if, if we zoom into the generated map, so we can clearly see that there is a topographical, uh, the, uh, a heterogeneous uh, mix of the topography, which uh, uh, highlights the uh, problem in the area from the Najabgarh area to the Ghata area, uh, from, coming from the nor northern uh, uh, top, uh, no northern uh, left uh, to the bottom right uh, of the entire district. So uh, what happens is that uh, Najabgarh is a place where we found that uh, from Ghata, which is from the south of the uh, Gur uh, Gurgram city, the Najabgarh drain, the elevation is around 70 meters apart. So, uh, however, the flood, uh, the flood, uh, the waters are uh, supposed to accumulate in the Nazavgarh drain, but the due to these urbanization that is happening within the city, the problem of water logging happens, and the, uh, probably the uh, all these drains that are there, they are encroached upon. So, this uh, creates a problem, further problem of water logging in the city. So in this, we did the built-up analysis uh, for decades apart. So we took uh, a year difference of 10, 10 years, uh, ranging from uh, starting from very 1985 to the present uh, built-up that is there uh, in the municipal corporation area. So as you can clearly see, uh, there is a settlement pattern that ha has been evolving around from the city core. And then uh, it has completely taken over the municipal boundary area. And uh, uh, the various drains also that were mentioned, uh, that were highlighted in the study area map that we created. So it can be clearly seen uh, that the uh, urbanization has been taken <coughs> over uh, and has, uh, has, has been settled over the drains only that uh, eventually causes the water logging issues in various points. So as you can see that we have around the water water logging uh, the water logging points in the city. So we found around 110 water logging points in the city. And however, uh, pointing out to the main water logging uh, points were the uh, Hero Honda Chalk and the Gulf uh, the uh, uh, Gulf that we talk about. So there's a Gulf Coat which is highly inundated in terms of the urban planning. So coming to the evaluation criteria, so we tried to analyze it. Uh, uh, so uh, the entire study was uh, divided into various themes. So the first theme was talking about how the pluvial flood and the issues, water issues rela related to pluvial flood has to be assessed. So in order to understand the issue, we need to address the issue first. So uh, this was done in terms of the, the scoring zero and one, which meant that whether these development plans actually uh, uh, highlight these issues in terms of uh, either we talk about the groundwater or the surface uh, uh, surface uh, quality uh, of the uh, water. So 
that was done and then again uh, the depth uh, analysis in terms of the uh, the storm water drainage whether they are there and this was done uh, the scoring was done in uh, the four pointers like 0 1 2 3 which uh, again identify the stages of uh, uh, implementation that has been done so first uh, was to understand that whether they are mentioned in the development or not and then and then moving on to whether they are implemented so the four stages were identified and then the ranking was given so uh, this was the parameters, uh, the various parameters taken, and uh, out of the 47 parameters, so 46 parameters that we took. So the after we did the scoring, at how much uh, problem has been highlighted in the various development plans and also the various reports. Uh, so the scoring came out to be six out of 46. So only. Uh, uh, six, uh, the value of six was given, uh, and uh, which is a comparatively very less uh, scoring in terms of mentioning, mentioning and uh, proposing solutions for the problem, uh, the water logging problem. So in this, basically, uh, we uh, generated a chart in which uh, uh, the, the various reports and the development plans that we studies, uh, studied. So uh, it uh, basically, the categories that we took were the content, the chapterization, the literature analysis, the case analysis, maps, and the assessment, and also the interventions that have been mentioned uh, in the various reports and the development plans. So in the development plans, only uh, it talked about the structural uh, interventions uh, in terms of the stormwater drain uh, channel channels and the proposal of those channels, uh, and nothing other than that in terms of mitigation and uh, management strategies. Uh, same for the flood control order. So uh, we found out that in the flood control, although it was dedicated to uh, addressing the fluvial flood issues, However, it talked about more about the mitigation, uh, the uh, the management issues that rather than the mitigation uh, aspect of it, and tried to uh, to curve that problem in the aspect that the it although the problem was already existing, we focus on how to you know have problems like creating awareness or have a rescue team, which which I uh, which as in, in point of the uh, planners and the architect, uh, architects table, I think that has to be taken into consideration that how can we solve that issue by addressing it before it comes to the city. So again, uh, for the uh, bylaws, we found out that only significant amount of like uh, the strategies were talked about, like rainwater harvesting was one of them. Then, uh, uh, and, and then uh, likewise, we identified various reports. And then if, uh, uh, we talked about the, uh, pri uh, the, uh, the organizations that were privately to uh, working in terms of uh, urban flooding within the city, we found out that they were more brief about the challenges that were happening. So uh, although they were uh, addressing the issue on the local level, but to try to understand how these drainage systems and how these stormwater drainage systems and solid waste management can be taken into consideration, and how can they be implemented within the, these, uh, uh, these uh, and, and, and they can be, uh, the, uh, like the problem can be uh, curbed in that way. Sorry, uh, can you conclude? Yeah, yeah, this is a concluding thing. Yeah. So as we are aware that the development plans are the key plans which you know define the uh, urbanization or the development within the city, but uh, we, uh, it was astonishing to see that these uh, these pointers that we talked about was not even mentioned in the development plans. So understanding that this uh, city, the, there is a lack of understanding of these issues in the city itself. So uh, like, uh, and, and when we talk about Gur Gurgram, it is one of the uh, highest received like they received the highest attention in terms of the pluvial flooding issues but however we talk about so many sustainability uh, we talk about the sustainability issues and the resilience however these were not even considered into the development plan further uh, even if there were certain plans that existed certain reports that existed they talked about the, uh, the management issues rather than the mitigation issues that has to be done uh, before the planning of the city has to be taken into consideration so, uh, uh, and, and in terms of the uh, reports that we found were done uh, independently, had a more brief and uh, uh, a mitigative approach of doing things like that.
so uh, that was it and uh, we think that uh, according to the uh, uh, study that we have conducted we analyze that it is there's a need to incorporate such uh, mitigation strategies within this system this is not to disc uh, uh, this, uh, basically discourage that uh, the development plans are not up to the mark but this is basically to understand how we can uh, amend those uh, development plans and identify issues within them so these were the references Thank you so much for your time. Thank thanks, you. Uh, thanks, team. Uh, yeah, flooding is the greatest, I think, risk issue uh, in many cities in India. We'll come back with the questions whenever that comes. Uh, the third presentation, I think, uh, Sumitra Nair is online uh, from Ashoka University. Her uh, title of her paper is "Sensing Infrastructure in the Time of Climate Emergency: The Case of Two Protests." by the arabian sea over to you. Uh, hello everyone you get hi thank you well much yes uh, yeah. and uh, keep a watch on your uh, chat box team will yes. be watching you with the time uh, are you able to hear me fine yes go ahead uh, you able to see the uh, slides fine yes okay um so um uh, i come i come to this panel from a slightly different uh, angle i'm an anthropologist by training i'm doing my phd at ashoka in anthropology uh, and my methods are ethnographic so a uh, slightly different uh, kind of uh, uh, storytelling is is what you uh, uh, get from me uh, how in terms of threads i was thinking what ties us together and so um, the story that i'm going to tell you is from uh, you know from uh, felt sustainability to a question of felt crisis Uh, number one and number two uh, to speak to the previous speakers um, the water city citizen citizenship relationship as a problem of uh, i pose it as a problem of imagination and as a problem of translation uh, so here goes um, right um so uh, beginning towards the end of the 2019 monsoons and running right through uh, the peak of the covid-19 pandemic the women of chellanam at the edge of cochin municipal corporation in the city of cochin sat on a relay hunger strike that lasted for more than a thousand days their demands were straightforward and fundamental they wanted the state to take urgent step to stop coastal erosion in chellanam chellanam situated about 15 kilometers south of fort cochin uh, is a coastal locality in the shadow of the cochin port most of the population are filler uh, fishers Uh, and chellanam's earliest experiences of extraordinary climate phenomena in recent times was 2014 uh, sorry 2004 tsunami more recently uh, chellanam was ravished by cyclone uh, cyclones uh, oki and tauki in 2017 and 18 um, and uh, of course the 2018 and 19 floods uh, during the monsoons and uh, every monsoon ever since so the accumulation of these experiences of these losses and the state's apathy triggered this current strike Uh, about 100 kilometers north along the same coast a second community also launched a protest towards the end of last year and that is ongoing this second protest is in the anticipation of a loss uh, the families of the coastal locality of velail in calicut city or korikod as it's called are protesting korikod municipal corporation's proposal to build a sewage treatment plant or stp as we call it in their neighborhood Bellil uh, is uh, one of again Korikod's most densely populated areas. Uh, also, Bellil is somewhat ecologically unique. It is where mangroves meet seawater. Uh, there is also very real fear that, given the new unpredictability of climate events and frequency of cyclones, the STP could get damaged, and the effluences would lead to toxicity in this densely populated area. So, this paper takes these two agitations as provocations to explore three questions. First, the question of infrastructures or urban infrastructures: what are they? What do they produce? Second, the question of climate change. On the one hand, are the batterings of extreme climate events that are already here, as I as I showed you in the Chellanam case, and the second are the potential climate change induced hazards that Velail is already anticipating. Is there a way that we can think about both these frames of climate uh, emergency, one which is lived? and one which is in the future together a third and perhaps uh, the key question that i am interested in the, in this paper is the question of time time both activates and is activated in infrastructure making and experience of climate disasters so the two cases uh, that i'll talk talk about today i promote i propose that climate change is also a cri crisis of um, uh, imagination 
as embodied in urban infrastructures. In times of such climate crisis, urban infrastructures seem to place limits on both histories and futures. I propose that considerations of time allow us to bring infrastructures and questions of climate change in conversation with each other in the city. Nikhil Lanand, in his study of uh, Bombay's uh, municipal waterworks, conceptualizes infrastructures as socio-technical systems that frame the politics of life. The city, as well as its waters, are political actors. Chalanand did not always see waters as a threat. From Kudmulur in the north to Alapura in the south to Cochin in the center, uh, Chalanam used to be uh, situated within a hundred kilometers continuous seafront till Cochin port was expanded and modernized in 1928. By their design and function, ports need to periodically dredge their sea floors to remove silt and sand that builds up over time. The problem is that dredgers are large scale equipments. So dredging uh, Cochin port's pathways was bound to eat up adjoining Chalanam's beaches. Adding insult to injury, when the strikes, strike committee in Chalanam requested that Cochin Port deposit the dredged up sand on their own beaches, after all, these are from the same place, uh, they were denied. In fact, Cochin Port decided to sell the sand outside, all of which added up to uh, uh, Chalanam's woes. Historian Gra Gabriel Hecht defines the Anthropocene as the apotheosis of waste. She invites us to look closely at the brutal histories of this waste, or one may say in this case of land and sand made waste. Even as Chalanam offers to take up the dredged, uh, you know, metabolic waste of uh, Cochin port, the unbearable uh, modernity of infrastructure becomes truly unbearable for the people of Chalanam. Uh, Brian Larkin in, writes evocatively about the poetics of infrastructure, where citizens are called upon to believe in infrastructures as if they are social facts. Infrastructures become enchanted stand-ins for the state in all its beauty and all its possibility. They may even lead to storytelling, perhaps as ways to make sense of and cope with new circumstances. I propose that in increasingly um, um, uh, these times of climate crisis, uh, there are uh, these infrastructures end up becoming limits to imagination. Cochin City and the Cochin Port in particular is valorized in songs and stories, old and new as the magical note that gave Cochin its current commercial cosmopolitan global past. The disappearing uh, sands of Chalanam resist this cosmopolitan and sort of positive storytelling of these uh, histories. The vanishing sands of Chalanam also point, point to the other poetic effect of infrastructure that uh, Larkin discusses, that of doubling. Uh, so uh, where systems and practices operate in variance with their proposed objective, a prior wave of Protests in 2017 and 18 had led the administration to lay geotubes along this uh, Chalanam coast. Geotubes are basically synthetic tubes which are filled with sand and they put on the shoreline to resist erosion. Uh, however, um, um, the contractor appointed had no history of doing such work and the company claimed to run out of sand to fill the tubes. Tides washed away these uh, half done tubes after some point. So later, the state granted permission to dredge sand from these same beaches to fill up these tubes. Eventually, waves uh, destroyed uh, 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 these tubes altogether. After a while, the, uh, the remaining geotubes were found floating on the sea. Could we make sense of such moves other than through the lens of you know, just urban corruption? Um, <clears throat> so uh, drawing on Eduardo Kohn's invitation to think like a forest, uh, Hannah Knox invites urban planners to think like a climate. Uh, and uh, she says, that we think not as an, uh, we think of planning not as an autonomous singular act of rational individuals, but as the result of different forms of life interacting with each other, arriving at shared ad, ad, uh, identifiable patterns. This approach has at least two affordances. First, um, it enables translation between elements that make up this universe. Second, it allows us to make space for effects of weather um, and the abstract uh, numbers heavy long durée of climate closer. So um, Chalanam's experience with geotubes then is a classic case of not thinking like a climate. So um, along with loss of lives and, um, sorry, um, along with the loss of uh, life and livelihood, what else is lost in climate disasters analytically? What is lost is history. Uh, Paul Edwards claims that technology eats history in the Anthropocene. Um, and uh, when the state permits dredging of sand from the very beaches that the sandbags would be laid on, it and the sandbags both eat into Chelnanam's history and its potential futures. 
I suggest that infrastructure making in the time of climate emergency is increasingly becoming a contest between at least two different conceptions of time and future. First, of a fantastic, you know, uh, techno scientific future that will somehow pro provide escape velocity from a volatile past. The second, a future that insists on remembering its past and that looks to this infrastructure made future with fear. Uh, the greater the lived experience of volatility, the more an instance insistence on the past and a less and less the hope of the future. So consider the second um, case of Belisle that I was speaking to you about, um, uh, uh, where they are protesting the coming of a sewage treatment plant into a uh, densely populated coastal uh, community. Its residents uh, asked at least three fundamental space-time questions. First, as Daoud, uh, who is one of the representatives of the uh, Janakia, the Democratic Strike Committee in that community, uh, asks, how would Kodikod Municipal Corporation magically lay sewage pipes? in a community where it has failed to even bring portable water. Second, the question of toxicity. Where will the discharges go? Vellail is at the junction of, of mangroves, a small stream, and a, and a fishing harbor. Further, he asks, will it not stink? Lastly, uh, following the recent floods, and knowing that climate disasters are already here, how would accidents be pre prevented? In short, what about the history of Vellail as a place uh, inhabited by humans and other forms of life? Infrastructures are imagined as uniquely potent, sub, uh, potent subject-making, time-making, uh, time machine-like actors. To put this image, this particular image that you see in context, this is, a, this is some, um, you know, uh, Kodikod Municipal Corporation uh, officials drinking water recycled from another STP in the city. For Velayil, this magical recasting was done by the mayor, uh, uh, who simply said that, um, uh, 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 who simply said in, in, in defense of the, uh, um, ST, uh, the STP, that these pipes will not touch the land at all, and any waste would be converted into organic fertilizer. This, I propose, is a fantastic future of efficient waste management through engineered equipment, which is completely uh, suspended in time and space. It, it does not address Velayil's current anxieties, since it is not re rooted in Velayil's present, nor in its history of mangrove sport, or even the Arabian Sea. So, um, so where, what are we looking at? Uh, infrastructures by their sheer material and conceptual heft tend to have the potential to remake time and space. Uh, in this paper, I first considered the question of infrastructure itself, its ability to metabolize resources and uh, to generate waste-like residues, uh, the sand that I spoke about earlier, and also the limits to their imagination. Uh, consider that uh, on 11th June uh, 2022, the Chief Minister of Kerala inaugurated a multi-crore seawall project at Chalanam that would install these giant uh, concrete uh, you know, tet tetrapods that you're looking at over 10 kilometers of the beach. Within days of their installation, the rains followed and Chelanam was not hit by the floods. However, Kannamali, which is the next neighboring community, was completely flooded. Now, of course, Kannamali uh, citizens are sitting on their own dharna, asking for tetrapods at their own um, beaches as well. <coughs> So, uh, in the current conditions of climate emergency, not only are the uh, the Anthropocene and its infrastructure uh, vehicles poor, uh, sorry, infrastructure projects poor vehicles to think with, they are guilty of forgetting or actively eating history or erasing time. They replace this history with utterly unimaginative futures that are no longer tenable. Uh, I think uh, I may be running out of time, so uh, maybe I'll stop here. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sumitra. <laughs> Yeah, as we know, with this uh, complex social and ecological junctures that we see in the city, we have added kind of a challenges with infrastructure and uh, technology. Uh, thanks. We have any other speakers? Okay. Um, unfortunately, the two speakers are not here, which were there in the schedule. So we can go to the question and answer uh, session. We will... Yeah, so maybe there is a time, so I will request if Jyoti wants to finish her presentation in just a couple of minutes, if it's possible, Jyoti. Yeah, thank you so much. I would love to do that. Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, so I'll quickly share my screen again. Just two minutes, okay? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you. Sorry. Uh, in these two minutes now.
Yeah. So actually, uh, I was uh, actually talking about the fact that policy needs to start looking at field sustainability as a very important way of getting volunteer involvement in in uh, sustainability. And a lot of the earlier speakers, I think, have experienced the same thing. We need to recognize that people do not see sustainability as an environmental issue. It's seen as a governance issue. And so, uh, yeah, because perhaps because the availability of water in homes is delinked with raw water in the proximate environmental source. Second, neither low field sustainability nor high sustainability is a trigger for environmental concern. So if we feel that by denying people water, it, uh, it is going to make them be more concerned about water, no. On the other hand, giving them enough water also will not make them uh, be concerned about water. Perhaps because uh, in the first case, um, you know, the, the need for survival uh, is just predominant and they do not feel they'll be able to make too much of a difference to a very, very bad situation. And in the second case, they do not feel the lack of water. And um, conservation usually uh, in in my, in all these years of experience and in my research, what we find is is either selfish or altruistic. So it's either because you're getting impacted uh, by the conservation behavior directly or because you are safe enough and therefore you can afford to be altruistic. Um, and this is my last slide. We do need to rethink water policy. We, we know that high field sustainability leads to low conservation behaviors. If that's the case, and if the government's mandate is to provide reliable, adequate quality water, then does, do you, uh, does this mean that it may actually deter voluntary citizen action for environmental sustainability? If that is the case, how do we negotiate the space? How do we negate uh, this impact? Uh, second, the, it raises the question of regulation versus a volunteer effort. If citizen investments in conservation are key to water sustainability, then in view of our findings, is it perhaps more pragmatic to take a regulatory approach rather than, uh, uh, you know, uh, depending on people to take voluntary action? Uh, you actually find uh, evidence of this in approaches being taken by many of the Western nations, where people are dealing from the process of conservation and it's the government which is doing uh, everything, but it's taxing the people for it. So, uh, is that what our research seems to indicate, then governance. If majority people have low field sustainability, uh, and our research also showed up that when there is low field sustainability, then there is greater reliance on local governance systems of water. And when there is high field sustainability, then people are comfortable with a government, um, uh, with a larger decentralized, with a centralized governance of water. So does this fact that we have majority have low field sustainability, does it seem to indicate that we need to make a shift towards local governance of water? And then uh, water self-sufficiency. If the relationship with the proximate source is critical uh, for volunteer efforts, then does that mean that we need to redefine our water planning paradigm from being supply driven or demand driven to being water self-sufficiency driven, which means that Bangalore says, this is my stock of water that I have, and I need to plan within that, and people need to become partners in that. So is that how we need to think? And finally, um, how do we create that water environmental source and water supply correlation? So um, that was, uh, that was yeah. you know, Thanks. the part that was left. Thank you. Thanks, Jyoti. Yeah, we'll uh, take questions one by one uh, from the audience first, and then we will read out the questions uh, who are there from the online. So, uh, my question was for Jyoti. Um, uh, you spoke about how high levels of felt uh, sustainability or scarcity also led to lower response. Uh, so I was very curious uh, to know what were the um, what were the causes for this, and also uh, did you find any difference in the five sites that you looked at, like basically urban poor, urban rich, and rural? So yeah, thanks. Yeah. So to answer your first question, uh, we are currently yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, we'll collect the questions from audience and then uh, tell panelists to respond. Yeah. 
so hi i have, i have a question for jyoti so uh, i i'm just interested to know like during your study what communities uh, exactly you uh, talk to like from which uh, caste and religion they belong to because india has a large uh, history of conflict of uh, caste and water so i'm really interested to know that any other among the audience um i have a question to i have two questions i have one question for akanksha and uh, uh, dipansha thank you for that presentation it was interesting um so there was this one map that you had showed with like possible areas of water logging and i was curious the method of that was that was that an overview of the development plans with the built up analysis or was that was that a real reality i i didn't understand the method behind uh, arriving at at those points with those real time sort of water logging or was that um or was that uh, you know from 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 secondary data analysis so that that's one question and the second one is again to jyoti um this in your last point you mentioned this idea of shifting between um the shift between govern looking at sustainability from like from governance to um uh sorry to, as an invite from a governance issue to an environmental issue and i'm 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 wondering whether um that shift um does it then change like change the burden of response on to like in, like how how do you respond to how that shift sort of puts the response on to individuals and sort of piecemeal sort of strategies i, I feel like the the response of looking at it as a governance issue also carries with it the opportunity that we need to be thinking of system systemic responses so just curious to know your thoughts on that thanks thanks um we'll ask there's one question online we'll just read that out um um there's a anonymous attendee online asks about tale of two cities one built by government navi mumbai to gurugram built by developers former tackled the flooding by proper technology and implementation second only built leaving the problems to the government to solve i think the problem in gurugram is primarily due to different approaches to city development do you agree and what are your uh, views on it that is for akanksha i think uh, thank you for the questions uh, i would like to address your question first so uh, the uh, entire process was to understand how water logging takes place in the city so uh, we took both the primary data and the secondary data and these were based on the real time data so we took the report various reports and also the newspaper uh, articles that talked about the various problems that were existing so they were based on the real time that uh, existing problem areas that we talked so that is for your question for the second question i think uh we were talked about the various uh, reports and the understanding here was to understand that how different approaches are there which has to be addressed in the development plan because each of them are working in silos so that has to be brought to the table together to and either we can talk about it in terms of uh, preparing a development plan which talks about these issues or we can talk about incorporating all these agencies together to uh, to, to uh, basically solve the issues of uh, pluvial flooding in gujram so that is for my qu uh, question that has been uh, like answered thanks uh jyoti you had a set of questions you want to take those yeah so the first question was about uh, why did uh, people who had higher field sustainability not do enough for water uh, for con conservation and now uh, that was not um, our current research is actually trying to understand those but we did get some pointers in through our interviews and through uh, uh, through our secondary research so uh, the main reason for that was that um, they did not uh um, the numbers didn't seem real to them because they were getting enough water in their households the the and that's the entire premise on which this notion of field sustainability is built that when you get enough water you tend to think that there is enough water in the in the space out there uh and that is why you're able to get enough water and so people do not overtly indulge in 
do not uh, take up conservation behaviors however if you recall my one of my last slides i did mention that what we found was that uh, sustainability uh, conservation behaviors are either altruistic or selfish and so we did find a lot of people uh, doing uh, a lot of uh, um, seemingly high field sustainability people adopting conservation behaviors but they were doing it uh as a as a as a as an altruistic thing in terms of cons in terms of benefit to society without really linking it to their own sustainability in fact i have a very interesting uh we had a very interesting observation i'm not going to mention the name of the locality but there is a specific locality which has done a whole load of uh rainwater harvesting work one of the highest uh in the in the city uh they've done that and they did it purely as an altruistic thing uh, 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 as a part of a government campaign uh, when they were being awarded for um, being one of the best rwas for having done this and uh, subsequently when a different government came up with a rule which made it mandatory for every house to do rainwater harvesting this same locality is at the forefront of a fight with the government to not make that mandatory because they do not want to uh, the community doesn't want to impose it on itself so i'm just saying that altruistic behavior does not indicate uh, necessarily so i i hope that that answers your question uh, that felt sustainability uh, yeah so that that was one uh, one of you also asked the question about caste and uh, water so i'd like to respond to that again it was not a part uh, not a, it was not a part of our study uh, to actually i am uh, de dealing uh, to actually stratify our sample sets based on uh, that uh, kind of distinction however uh, those we do have um, uh, we we did have some communities which were um, uh, uh, you know communities of the at the lower end of the caste spectrum uh, so they were sc uh, with majority sc 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 populations not st majority sc populations they were basically um, in the urban poor area we also had minorities so we had some communities which were 100% um, of a minority uh, religion and um, um, yeah so the, um, we like i said we did not analyze our data from that perspective we'd love to go back to our data set to look at that but we did not find um, overtly any difference in the responses of communities based on anything other than their own felt experience of water so i feel that this is uh, uh, that there uh, it might be a different story that because they are marginalized communities their own felt experience might be lesser or uh, might be of a different quality so there is something to it and we'll certainly uh, look into that the last question related to governance uh, for water and i'd quickly like to say a couple of lines that's one of the big questions that this uh, felt sustainability notion throws up now i am a non profit an ngo and i firmly believe in the notion of uh, voluntary uh, work for um, sustainability and yet uh, the study seems to point that um, that uh, perhaps voluntary effort might not be forthcoming to the extent that we need to resolve this 55% gap between demand and supply uh, because uh, of how it makes people it doesn't make people uh, react uh, enough to take up voluntary efforts and so maybe systemic changes of the kind that you were talking which not just make water available to everybody but also work for conservation uh, please uh, uh, the previous presentations also spoke about how the government is making efforts Uh, to uh, provide water but it is not making similar efforts at its own end to conserve water and so what i would say is that perhaps systemic efforts in terms of both conservation and adequate supply will probably end up being the way forward if we are to match this 55% gap between demand and supply so thank you thanks uh, any or there is one more question online which i'm going to just read out a uh, question to jyoti again the concept of felt sustainability is intriguing do you think it is not seen as environmental issue because we have not been able to concretely define sustainability uh, and within brackets it says each sector perceives it perceived differently uh and do you think it is wise to make that paradigm shift from governance to environmental issue considering it is largely a people plus planet issue 
Um, I, I'm not sure I understood it 100% right, but I'll respond so the to the extent. So about yeah. uh, because the second bit. The, the findings that you are talking about, about the felt sustainability, is it because the sustainability itself, uh, the definition of it is vague and uh, uh, yeah. underlying? So that was one of our big findings. We did find that. We did find that each community defines sustainability differently. Again, based on their felt experience, and uh, however, uh, this this does not explain the the reason why people do not adopt conservation behaviors, regardless of how they define felt sustainability. So, so for example, I, I mean, I don't want to take up uh, so much time here, but uh, we did find that uh, that uh, each community defines sustainability differently, and thereby uh, there is definitely. Uh, uh, vagueness about it. However, and that again brings out this issue that we are saying, government, there is no confusion. The government has clear norms in terms of what is defined as sustainability and what is not. How much per capita per person per day is, uh, is, uh, is uh, when does uh, a community, when does an environmental source become uh, non-sustainable? There are clear cut uh, guidelines for that within the expert environmental expert space but in the people's mind space that doesn't exist and uh, so yeah so each one defines it differently however whatever be their definition their uh, their uh, their contribution towards conservation behaviors is delinked whatever it, it is only linked to their uh, feeling of whether or not they felt sustainable. There are people who feel there is sustainable water supply when they get uh, 200 liters per person per day. And there are people who don't feel it is sustainable when they get uh, 800 liters or 1000 liters per person per day. So that was uh, the second part of the question I didn't quite 100% understand. I think uh, so, you have covered in the response uh, both okay. the things actually. Um, Yeah, since uh, there are no more questions from the audience and also online, but we have uh, Vinit Chajar joined us uh, for presentation and we will give him some eight minutes to present. If you have to, uh, if you can do it quickly, Vinit, it will be great. Uh, and the title of the presentation is Strategies to Strengthen Urban Flooding Resilience, a case study of Jaipur. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry I missed the timeline. Uh, I'll present as quickly as possible. Is my side visible? Yes. So, uh, so there are there are things that has been done in uh, this sustainable urban development and uh, i am trying to come up with the directly to the issues of jaipur is why jaipur the first flooding happened in jaipur in 1981 with 626 mm of flood in 24 hours uh, then uh, in 2012 170 mm of flood in 14 august recently we had uh, 170 mm of flood which almost took 12 hours to drain off because the uh, the capacity for storm water drainage is 15 mm per hour so it was uh, uh, devastating uh, for the old city jaipur and the reason why it's happening is the runoff is increasing from 15 percent to 150 percent over a span of uh, six, 21 years now the research question is why urban flooding is happening why urban flooding is a disaster why is green blue infrastructure is important? Why do new need strategies to strengthen urban flooding resilience? What are the factors responsible for urban flooding? What is the frequency in urban flooding in Jaipur? What is the correlation to the environment, landscape ecology, urbanism, uh, climate change and economics? What are the watershed model available to for the evaluation of urban flooding? What are the attributes of resilience? How do we map urban flooding in city level? 
how has urban flooding been addressed till date so these are <clears throat> something so objective of the study to assess the effect of the land use and change in runoff uh, in the various regions of jaipur uh, uh, based on the watershed appraise the landscape morphology and and uh, uh, the few decades affected runoff characteristics of this watershed identify aquifer reacher zones in this watershed simulate blue green infrastructure in the watershed to mitigate urban flooding analyze the physical infrastructure in urban watershed identify multi stakeholders uh, directly or indirectly responsible for urban flooding to overlay various layers in an imp uh, input through gis and visualize urban flooding issue in in a larger context and interview and the bridge the communication between various stakeholders through physical and online survey sensitize the common people about the value and outreach and activism demonstrate urban flooding mitigation measures in educational campus to educate future generation about the value of water so this is the recent uh, study being done by un habitat in jaipur uh, uh, expecting this report to come out shortly but uh, this is what they have projected that 40 lakhs of population in in uh, already been in jaipur and there are like uh, the airport of jaipur currently sitting on a nala and to save that airport it has been decentralized the uh, drain runoff been uh, uh, decentralized so that it doesn't uh, wash away that uh, runoff which is creating that uh, 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 air, air uh, runoff runway so that uh, there, there is a flooding in the moti dungri area in in jaipur area that is happening this is what is happening uh, in terms of temperature and humidity i am not going into the details i'll come to the so there are it's not just uh, delhi mumbai or chennai it's being reported by cac and uh, uh, so so they they have uh, reported jaipur this in so there there are there are five rivers so uh, they when they have reported it was amanisa nala now it's a dravati river but unfortunately it's being concreted it's a drain it's a concrete channel rather than a, a, a river and the catchment area the uh, width of this this uh, river is also being reduced and made it into a concrete channel so so there there are some uh, iit delhi proposed something in 2012 for delhi but never implemented so they, these are like some keywords that they have uh, pointed the, that time to coordinate between soil type topography land use rainfall storm water drain network by the way there is no dedicated storm network available in jaipur it's a com common sewer line that is taking uh, 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 storm water as well as sewer and unfortunately the uh, neighborhood that happened to have the uh, storm water drain on either side of the road as is now gone with the interlocking tile and uh, giving more space for the parking though while buying a car you give a uh undertaking that you are you have a sufficient parking so reality is something different so there are this is a first slope when hydrology analysis is being done by un habitat that uh, uh, and these are some landscape morphology maps that is done by uh, kavita kedavat in her master thesis in sept so i am but it was in way back in 2009 so trying to correlate the uh, historical layers as well as the future layers so coming back to the older layer oldest layer that i have in terms of jaipur is the when it was designed in 19, 8, 1727 by maharaja savai jay singh uh, so so it was uh, a hill it was protected by hills on the northern side and city was designed on the southern side after amir was not having enough space for the future population so this is how uh, uh, the documentation of jaipur is there in 1960 map in texas library and from google archival map uh, the 630 years historical image is there so these are like some studies being done uh, i was doing this project jainwas bag with jaipur smart city previously with iptisa now the iptisa is not no longer working with jaipur but uh, while working this i got to uh, get hold of the historical layer which talks about the indigenous approach of water management through sunken uh, uh, four feet to six feet sunken uh, uh, productive mughal garden orchards which were supposed to 
uh, hold the water and there was to feed this uh, char bag or the pleasure garden it had uh, 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 raja malka talab and talkutora lake which no longer exists uh, this this is the uh, historical map of ramnivas bag which happens to be english garden but unfortunately now it's a traffic island similarly vidyadharji ka bag is also happened to have a sunken uh, this there, there was no lawns it was all white flowering plants and fruit citrus fruits and there was a system of wells aquifers step well to sustain this uh, gardens but uh, unfortunately it all after the british it's all uh, lawn and the uh, without thinking of the local climate and the thing so this army research has been done by professor under professor uh, amita sinha in arbana champion by miss uh, neha rajura so there is a, a continuous system of hydrologic uh, watershed well step well so there was a, a, a synergy between the system and uh, there are 800 wells available in jaipur but it's all defunct and unfortunately the rain water harvesting which is being done so the basic fundamental uh, Binit, can you go yeah. to your conclusion slides and wrap yeah. within a minute? Yeah. So I am. Uh, 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 so this is like the older image of Jaipur, and the, there was a step well, and this is the uh, uh, revitalization proposed by way back in two thousand eight by uh, SEPT University. So, so uh, coming back to my. so this is like uh, to uh, one of the project that i have identified in uh, older city uh, uh, purani basti there was a kund saraswati kund which is lying as a uh, uh, school so uh, while while studying the morphology i got to know we need to communicate between different agencies like nagar nigam smart city jd and all the municipality or the development authorities the issue is they are not talking to each other and layers are not superimposed in over gis only the uh, physical infrastructure is there the natural infrastructure or the landscape layers soil morphology or so those those layers are not there so uh, so uh, uh thanks yeah. vinith uh, yeah. i'll just uh, ask if there are any like one question we have Uh, gone over time already for the session. If there is any last question, I want to ask for Vinit. If not, uh, then thanks everyone for being here. And uh, uh, just to wrap the session, I would just like to highlight that these papers in these panels have showed us uh, how there are solutions and opportunities uh, exist to improve existing infrastructure. Uh, to invent new business models and find new ways to collaboration uh, between public private and civic society actors thus uh, urban res resilience provides an array of new tools uh, to help foster the emergence of sustainable uh, and enduring cities of uh, tomorrows uh, thank you so much for being here and we will come back to the next session at 3:30 uh, see you all thanks thank, thank you so much